I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Heba Fatani. Fire, you're fired. He's not gonna play with your kids. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Start looking for missing pieces in your house. Yeah. <laughs> this is where the whiteness overtakes my Arabness. <laughs> Thank you. She got me. I'm gonna put that in the outtakes. I, I had a feeling that was going to be the answer. This is where your kiwi comes in. That's where my kiwi comes in, yeah. I wanna surprise you. Okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> You're very easy to talk to. Thank so, you, I appreciate um, it. I bloody hope so. That's what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> BuzzFeed had a 2020 list of the top 10 places you must visit. The fifth spot went to this emirate. BuzzFeed said that this emirate is a global destination for thrill seekers and explorers because of its beautiful and rugged landscape. The same emirate ushered in the new decade with style, smashing a fireworks Guinness world record, their fifth world record. This emirate is also the emirate that is home to the UAE's highest peak, Jabal Jace. Now, if you live here or are familiar with the GCC, then you know that I'm referring to the Emirate of Ras Al Khaimah. In 2018, a government body was established by a Supreme Council member and the ruler of Ras Al Khaimah, His Highness Sheikh Saud bin Saqar Al Qasimi. This body had a clear vision to put Ras Al Khaimah on the map both regionally and globally. I'm delighted that my guest today is the Director General at the Ras Al Khaimah Government Media Office. The lady at the helm who leads and drives the strategic communication for the northernmost emirate of our United Arab Emirates. My guest was born and raised in Saudi Arabia. She did her kindergarten, her schooling, her university, everything in Saudi Arabia. As she likes to put it, she is a product of Saudi Arabia. It was Warren Buffett who said that habits are like chains in our life that are too loose to notice until they are too tight to break. Our habits ultimately reflect the quality and the results we achieve in life. And my guest has a distinctive positive habit that has helped her go from one success to the next. I won't say just yet, but I'm sure you'll pick it up in our conversation. She's independent, inspirational, strong, and has always been in demand. I say that because my guest has held prominent positions with interesting bosses, one of whom is the chairman of Kingdom Holding Company. You know, the global company that belongs to one of the richest men in the world, His Royal Highness Prince Walid bin Talal, while working at the Kingdom Holding Company. My guest was the senior executive manager in corporate communications, where she oversaw the branding, communication strategy, media operations, and also was part of the driving force when they IPO'd in 2007. And now her boss is the ruler of Ras Al Khaimah, His Highness Sheikh Saud bin Saqar Al Qasimi. My guest is a warm and lovely human being. She's an inspiration to whoever comes in contact with her. She's excellent in her communication. She's innovative. She's driven. And when she becomes passionate about something, she dives all in. My guest is a self-admitted workaholic who knows no different and has always worked hard from the get-go. This is How Do They Do It? I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Heba Fatani. I appreciate you making the time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remember our first conversation. Somehow, the first thing we ended up talking about was procrastination. And I, I think I shared with you, <laughs> I shared with you the fact that it took me five years to put a podcast together. For a lady who, if someone doesn't know her from the outside world, you're a superhero. You know, everything has just been on the up and up. Everything seems right. Prominent positions. Everything is awesome. Does a lady like you ever procrastinate? All the time. <laughs> so um, I think it's not uh, procrastination as much as there's a lot of things happening in my life. So yes. I take it 
my time to think which one comes first and that might translate into procrastination because I would want to perfect the timing of something or I want to give it enough time, I want to relish over it. So it, I guess it can become borderline procrastination Yes. because I would think about it, put it in the back burner a bit, then you know, engage with it again and see where I want to, what I want to do with it. So, um, and could you take me through this process? Because it's interesting because it's a formula for some, you know, for some folks and it works for them where they like to simmer on things. How do you work out if someone is giving you an offer or something is on the table? For, perhaps you can give us an example of a situation where you had to think it over. What are you considering when you're factoring things in? You know, what makes important what falls under unimportant? I'm going to get back to this. Okay. So there will be situations where you don't have time mm -hmm. and you have to act on the spot. Uh, sometimes time is your biggest enemy, like in crisis management. Yes. You, know, you have the golden hour where you have to act on the spot. And if you don't, then someone else will tell the story and you might not like the outcome. So that there's no room for procrastination. You just have to put the uh, your mind to it, see what are your best outcomes and take action accordingly. I think the ones that you take time uh, to think about are the things that are of a bigger nature, more of a strategy. Uh, you want to think about things that have um, where the stakes are high when yes. you are taking decisions over um, you know, a path that a company or, you know, um, a certain uh, initiative that you want to take. You have to take all sides in. You have to factor in, uh, okay, in my mind, it sounds amazing. Um, you know, so-and-so people will also ascribe to it. But I also have to factor in those who will not or how can it be taken from a different angle. And yes. I need to factor this in and, you know, weigh uh, which is more important, uh, pushing it through or maybe changing the narrative. So that might take time because maybe I have at that point of time the luxury of time. Yes. Uh, so I would actually think more about the outcome, how I want to tweak it. It's a little bit, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and yes. that works for me and against me yes. because um, I keep on looking back at things and how I want it to come out. Now, uh, that uh, in itself uh, allows you more time to look at things, do your research, do your dil diligence. So data and information help you take decisions. Yes. So I rely a lot on information. I, uh, I look at what are the best practices, but I make it bespoke to the situation that I'm in or the entity that I'm dealing with. Yes. Get inspired. Whether you're in Dubai for business or pleasure, the last thing you want to do is blow your budget on accommodation, which is why I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. Beyond being price sensitive, what I love about Rove Hotels is the fact that they are a combination of cafe, culture, and just coolness. Even my guests, many of them, when they arrive before we record or after we finish recording the podcast, they actually comment. They go, wow, this place is cool. The vibe is amazing. And it is amazing. So if you're in Dubai for business or pleasure, I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. This episode is brought to you by M Dojo. Whether you're in business or new to business, you need three things. A good website, traffic, and being able to convert that traffic into paying customers. That's what MDojo does best. They're able to create for you a functional state-of-the-art website, drive targeted traffic, and put in all the elements needed in order to convert that into paying customers. Isn't that what you want? Of course it is. Give the team at MDojo a call and see how they can help you increase your sales and profits. Tell them I sent you. Their website, mdojo.com. C -O. The thing is because we live in a world where we're constantly, especially today, more than ever, we're constantly bombarded with distractions and opportunities. And one of the key drivers to success is being able to know where I want to go and staying focused. Being able to say no sometimes to things in order to be able to get to where you want to. How do you stay focused? 
Yeah, because I'm sure someone like you is in demand. And you have to set your priorities. What do you want to achieve? Mm. How much time do you have? So you have to map out the situation. Yes. And uh, you know you have to stay focused. By some, sometimes you will do something, or you know, in my in my case, um, when I first started working in Saudi Arabia, it was um, not common for a uh, Saudi female to work in an investment company. We were I worked alongside my colleague, male, female. It was an environment where it was it was driven by achievement and yes. the bottom line rather than what gender it is, but. In the beginning, I had sort of resistance um, of um, you know uh, either the peop- the men uh, that uh, worked with us uh, did not really feel comfortable working with me, mm. um, or for example, um, a male that did not feel like he uh, he was comfortable reporting to a female, and these things occur. I think the best way is. I always say it's like uh, a horse in a race. You put these blinders, your eye is on the target and you just go there. You can't get sidetracked. Yes. And with your work and with your determination, people subconsciously, you know, ride in on your ride because they don't want to stop and you're pushing forward and they're going to just be left behind. So they end up forgetting what gender or what what have you yeah it becomes you, the work it right it becomes the work and the it results becomes the focus yes chop chop let's do it fast let yeah. you know so it's no longer who's asking the request it's the the way things go forward uh, determine how um, we're going to take decisions how fast how slow i'd love to get your your thoughts since you you brought up work you know especially in the earlier days i've got a, a number of questions i'd like to ask um, you've held prominent positions so what I'd love to know is coming out of university because you didn't take a break, you pretty much just went head to work. I'd love to know things like, did you write a CV? How did you get your job? How did you stand out you know, from the masses, especially back in that time? So my- when you didn't have the track record, I mean, now I'm sure you're, you're being headhunted or people know about you or want you, but at that stage when you're still you know, fresh, you're still young and your slate is clean in essence. I would say uh, I would take you back to what was my mindset back then. That'd be lovely. So um, my my father was uh, may he rest in peace was a champion of empowering women uh, and of course me and my sisters uh, he supported my mom when she wanted to do her own business. Um, she, he was uh, in the. Um, in the foreign uh, ministry of Saudi Arabia. He was based in the US as a cultural attaché. Before that, he did um, his uh, higher education in Columbia University. My mom at that time, who's from Egypt, was, you know, uh, she was a new bride and she wanted to do something. So he supported her. He told her, why don't you, you know, you're now in the US, so there are so many opportunities that you can bring back home. So it started with her where he supported her and she it ended up as a thriving, successful business in, in, know, Saudi. in Saudi Arabia. Wow, fantastic. Uh, at that time. Uh, same with my sisters, you know, he supported every decision that they took of how they wanted to uh, accomplish their life. They're quite accomplished. Um, my sister, Amal, she's a professor um, in pharmacology. Mm. My other sister, Iman, she has a clinic. Uh, dentistry, uh, a polyclinic, and, and may then, I ask you just before you you continue with there? But when you, when you say your father showed support, how did he show that support? He showed support uh, in the sense he always, you know, ascribed to the fact that you as women, you have to be uh, able to put your own weight in the society, to put your own uh, potential and. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. And this was something he would verbalize he would to you verbalize. girls. Awesome. And um, and my mom uh, was always saying, every woman, whether she is married, not married, a widow, uh, divorced, they ha- she has to be financially independent mm. because you never know what happens in life. You never know when, you know, maybe your husband loses his job and you have to support or you end up not getting married. You cannot depend on someone. You have to depend on your own self. Mm. And it defines who you are in society as well. So, you know, the mix of both of them together, it almost 
seemed not even an option not to work as soon as I graduated. It was uh, a sense of it was an environment how, how can I not work? Yeah. Yes. So this was this was the expected. This was the sort of the fear factor inside of me. Like no, I have to work. I have to support myself. So I actually was financially independent uh, even with my small salary i kept within my means mm. uh, i did not ask for any money from my family since i was maybe 26 years old Respect. i would say so the first job didn't really pay much and i really didn't need their support but um when when i was able to um, support myself this is what i did and now uh, i can't even imagine going back to my family my family are there they would not even hesitate one second but it just becomes so much harder to do that yes the the first job that i uh, that i had was actually in egypt and i i was driven by the fact that i need to work uh, i i looked at what can how can i add value where are the where are my strengths and yes. i looked for a job that matches what I felt as a fresh graduate matched my strengths. Get inspired. One of the questions that I get frequently asked is, Kev, how can I increase my motivation? We see great individuals, we see achievers, like many of the guests that I'm bringing on the show. They have the energy, they do so much, they're in a state of flow. How do they do it? Well, my team and I have released an article which I've made available on kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog the ultimate biohacking guide to increasing motivation. Or you can simply Google Kevin Increase Motivation and the article should pop up right at the top. It's absolutely free. Read it and most important of all, take the bits and pieces that are relevant to you and apply it into your life to increase your motivation. I hope you find the article of value. If you do, feel free to leave your comments and also share it with your circle of friends. Again, you can Google it. Kevin Increase Motivation, it will be the first link that pops up, or on my website, kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog. And, and did you feel like you had a sense of direct, like you knew you had to do something? Did you have a sense of direction? I, I, had, um, I had this thought that the job is going to talk to me, so uh -huh. I needed to go and see, and if I find myself in an environment that I can, you know, ascribe to what they do, their values, that th this is, would be the right job for me. I did not take it as a job description, but I wanted to take the whole value system of that organization. I, so my, actually my first job was with the USAID. It was a Fulbright Commission and they supported, it was in Egypt and they had a, uh, a project where they uh, supported um, uh, English um, uh, teachers of um, you know who, Egyptian English teachers and uh, how to support them into better uh, education and how to look at um, uh, what to bring back home uh, as ideas of teaching methods mm. of uh, you know skill set. So I, I, I found myself enjoying that. It was a brief time because it was a six year project and I came in on sort of like the last year the last leg of yeah, it so the last leg of it but you had graduated in saudi i had graduated so, in saudi was that move uncomfortable was it was uh, it, just... it wasn't because my mom is egyptian okay. so uh, you know i've spent half my life uh, going on vacationing in egypt so and it was I wanted, a normal thing you know okay. it was a normal transition and then um i came back to saudi and uh, again i looked for something that really spoke to me at that time my friend um Actually, it was my best friend. She was, uh, she is, she's still my best friend. <laughs> still <laughs> best friends. We're not over. Uh, yeah. We're still good. But uh, she, she was working in the National Guard Health Affairs, um, which is an organization. Um, there's three major hospitals for the National Guard in the Eastern region, the Western region, and the Central region. So uh, you have um, a capacity for 6,000, uh, you know, over 6,000 to 7,000 employees at that time. Mm. And at that time, Saudi Arabia was going through the internet evolution, yes. so to speak, the Y2K, you know, the day you wake up and you don't know if your TV was going to switch on We stocked on up a not. lot of food in New Zealand. <laughs> right? we, we had so, a whole room of canned so food. Uh, so it was a big it was, thing. It was a good know? marketing uh, trick. 
And at that time, I, I got fascinated with that. And she said, why don't you come and join the, you know, the IT department of the National Guard Health Affairs? And they're going through a transition. They want to create an, um, an interlink. Uh, Internet, yes, and they wanted to connect all the organizations together. And, and, and she thought of you. Be was this because of your skill set or the she degree of you me had, because, uh, or just because she, she wanted me. to be with her friends? No, but also she. I mean, she put a recommendation on. Okay. She saw me as a driven person. I reported to her, so yes. she was my uh, immediate boss. And uh, she saw something in me. I was eager. I was willing to do that. And my English and Arabic were both, you know, good. So. You know, she said, why don't you try it and see how it feels? That ended up being five years there. I, uh, I did some, you know, at that time, creating a website and uh, um, I became a webmaster. So okay. I created websites. Now everything is just a tool and you can just click. Just and, yes. <laughs> but Very at that time, we actually times, had to create them. And there was great initiatives uh, done at that time. There was initiative of the conjoined twins. You know, um, the National Guard had a great success track record with a, a very complicated conjoined twins operations. Wow. So we had connections as well, uh, extranets with um, different medical facilities and organizations. So we had to uh, show the all 22 all Saudi doctor team. Uh, doctor and nurses, the whole team was Saudi. So wow. that was a big thing for Saudi Arabia to show that uh, we really excel in uh, healthcare. Mm. So I loved being a part of that ride. And uh, then, you and, know. And do you feel that was, was there, was it a skill? Was it your attitude? Was it the fact that you spoke Arabic and English that helped you do well it's in that role? It's probably a combination of all. You okay. know, I, I, I love work. I'm sort of a workaholic, so I. Uh, you don't. Need, you you come across as yeah, someone who doesn't yeah. need to be told to work. It's, like it's just in you. You know, I, I I get passionate about something and I dive all in. Yes. And I suppose that's something that any employer would look for. In yes. So, so I enjoyed it and I gave it my all. Can I ask you when when you were when your friend had recommended for you to to come and join in. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a hit and miss, right? Because you'll have a lot of individuals, maybe you've come across some of them, but I know that people who are watching or listening, um, I see this all the time traveling as a motivational speaker. There are many folks who are working as employees and they're like, oh, but I'm not passionate about it, but I'm not this and I'm not doing something I like. It could have been the case for you or was it a case of whatever the situation is, I'm gonna find something that I can be passionate about. You're never gonna like everything in your job. <laughs> well said. <laughs> okay. I can so tell that, you right now, there is, are many things that I'm doing these days yeah, I still don't like. That is utopia. Yes. Yeah. And that's not reached. But you need to well concentrate said. on what you really like about the job. And then the things that come, it's just like in school, you had your favorite subjects. Yes. Uh, but then just to get, you know, to graduate from school, you had to do the subjects you really didn't like. Yes. It's just, it's a mindset. You 100. have to look at the bigger picture. You have to look at the end game. What are you going to achieve? How are you going to... Um, grow as a human being, what added value do you have in your job? I'll tell you one thing that would actually make me leave a position mm. or a job. It's a position where I am not growing as a human being, I'm yes. not learning. So I love to um, uh, get to know new things. I don't like to limit myself within a job description. Mm. I always say you make the job, the job doesn't make you. So well you can come in and you can check the boxes of that job description, but what happens after that is your own doing. Yes. Um, so yes, of course, there were some tasks that were tardy, you know, tedious, sorry, yes. and you didn't want to do them, but you look at the bigger picture, so things move on. And as I said, I, uh, I had my friend, but I also have great respect for her. She was uh, really good at what she did, and we had a really good, um, uh, separation between uh, work yes. and our relationship as friends. We yes. really did it quite well, which actually served me well later on. I'm able to separate between my personal life and my work life. So I can, you know, we can squabble over uh, semantics in work yes. or something that we want, but we, you know, it stops there and then 
my uh, separately I can be your friend and we can you know hang out together I yes. don't have to see eye to eye with you to be able to be your friend very well said absolutely mm-hmm. and this is a this is something that many have to come to work with or come to realize that if we're friends and we have also worked together conflict at work or a debate or a disagreement has got nothing to do with relationship out of work as they say it takes two to tango yes you know I can do that, but the other side has to be equally mature yes. about things. Yes, so, 100%. Yeah. You do your five years there. Mm. Um, I guess, when did you realize it was time for you to move on? I didn't. Okay. I wanted I to had stay there forever. That, I, I got had a feeling that was going to be the answer. Yeah. I got headhunted. <laughs> so I was contacted, actually. So uh, I was just so happy there. Had my friends, had my system. Although it was, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big... Um, you know, package, uh, but it checked all other boxes. Yes, and it's extremely important. I was important, learning, yeah. and uh, you know, the National Guard really invests a lot in their employees to enable them to reach their full potential. So mm. courses, so that for me is equivalent to a financial compensation. It was serving your needs. Yes. Yeah. And at the time, I mean, I was young. This is the time where you learn and you work. Yes. And then, so what was the progression from there? Mm. The progression from there, let's see if it's for the camera. I want to surprise you. Okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> so I think before I got sucked in to the thing was, I, I asked, yeah, your progression. Like, you were there, you were happy. You know, things were good five years. What was the next thing? Or how did the next thing happen for you? In my mind, I was happy there, but yes. I knew at one point I'm going to need to, you know, grow. grow into a different direction, but I was sort of in my comfort zone. I enjoyed it. Great things were happening. Um, Can I ask you, at the, at the start of the five year and at that point before you had transitioned, what, how do you feel like you had evolved? Like, had you developed or refined certain skills that would have made you stand out? I, um, my uh, contribution grew with my intent to get more involved. Mm. So I worked on different things at that time in Saudi Arabia when they opened, um, you know, a door for the media to come in. Um, I was asked to be a part of the delegation that connects uh, with the foreign media. And I think this is really what set me on the course of communication from mm. there on. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed how I can have a sincere discussion, but also uh, get my messages through in a way and reading the person in front of me and seeing how I can communicate and how I can um, have my message resonate with that person. Did it come naturally to you? Or did you go, okay, communication is important now? Or was it a realization? No, have you I always knew it been was aware important. of it? I was just aware that I was good at it. Okay. So, uh, you know, from the feedback, from the, the reactions I got mm-hmm. from, you know, sometimes they would, there would be um, uh, someone who's skeptical about what you want or what you're trying to present, uh, you know, especially in the Middle East, we have a lot of, we were stigmatized with a lot of things. So, sure. you know, you have, you know, those reporters that really want to know the truth and those who come with a preemptive notion of, of what the truth is and they just want you to fill in that. They want to verify, uh, their, verify their, their, their what they're thinking. thinking. Yeah. And um, I felt that I, um, the way I connected on a level that is sincere and that is uh, more um, not trying to cover things up but really saying facts as they are but facts also hold two sides. They mm-hmm. have a positive side. So I was able in certain situations to affect that kind of change to yes. really maybe not completely convert someone, but at least have them accept the fact that there is a balance in that situation. When I felt like I'm able to do that, uh, and given the fact that you know in the Middle East we do come with a lot of stigmas, I felt that there was a reason for me to do this. I felt like... I can I can do this and if I can change a little bit of the misconceptions then this is more of a higher calling yes and I think this was the trigger to be able to affect that kind of positive change Mm. and you know for me one person that goes back you know to their 
uh, editor, uh, editor or and tell them, you know what, it's not really exactly how we thought it was and maybe change how they think about things or how they, what is the angle that could have been damaging and sort of became more balanced. Yes. Did you, and, then, and did you take the time to then, once you had that realization to go, I need to develop the skill or I'm thankful that my upbringing helped me develop the skill? Which one of the two would it, would it have been? Because in order for you to be able to change the narrative, you require elements of persuasion. There's elements of storytelling. Like, um, like you said, with the truth, that's how what? you deliver I, I it. I have not thought about it, yeah. how it came about. Perhaps because we were brought up to have an open dialogue with our parents. Okay. So, so perhaps uh, that was, was practice of, time. Yes, there was a lot of, you know, give and take. Uh, it's, um, you know, at the end of the day, my father took the final decision and my mother as well, but they opened room for deliberations. Yes. Um, I sort of won a lot of the arguments <laughs> with my parents. So I guess maybe, maybe it started there. Who knows? Yeah, because I see my nephew and he's only you know, six years of age. Yeah. And um, he's far ahead in his communication than I was when I, at, at the age of six, far ahead. And I noticed that one of the things that they do is they, they communicate with him and they allow him to do just that, like back and forth. I mean, mom and dad, I guess sometimes have the final say, but yeah, he, he's communicating, he's deliberating, he's arguing, he's negotiating, he's selling his art pieces. I was selling, yeah. I told him wow. yesterday, that, yeah, <laughs> He, he had done a really nice art piece. He put it on the family WhatsApp and he He's put it up for sale. Yeah, he, it seems like it. Yeah. And then I asked him if I could buy it. He gave me a, quite a large sum, 500 dirhams. I'm like, dollars. dollars. I was like, five dirhams, man. And he goes, we will negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that word until my mid-teens. How do you know negotiate? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, we'll talk about it when I drive you to Legoland because they're, they're playing down yeah. there. And... Um, and then he said something even more interesting, and I thought it was his dad helping him out, but in, apparently it's not. And he was saying, while, while I was in the shower, so I had no idea he had my phone. And, he didn't know and when I replied to him, he goes, "Hey, it's quality over quantity, and uh, there's only okay. one, and there's only one piece." I'm like, "Wow!" I am very impressed. Yeah, I was like, "Maybe I'm you, you do, you do deserve the five hundred dollars for your ability to negotiate." Start looking for missing pieces in your house. <laughs> <Yeah. by the laughs> he might. <laughs> you might sell them on. I have uh, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I guess you know perhaps that that allowance of being able to deliberate within your family could have helped. I think that today's generation um, have more open platforms in yes. schools. They encourage debates. Uh, they encourage you to go and present uh, your um, what you think about a certain subject. My daughter was a part of the MUN, which is called Model United Nations, mm -hmm. and it's um, you know it's a part of the UN. They do a chapter for schools where they uh, teach students how to. Uh, debate their uh, and state what they want to say in a way that is um, confirming conforming with the UN standards of discussions and the way to uh, you know produce your argument to support and defend your argument but mm -hmm. at the way that is very um, acceptable on global standards sure and the way that she it served her really well in her life because she is able to get her idea across very eloquently uh, and she accepts rejection but also she knows how to uh, go back and present her side of the story and Fantastic. she would you know so that kind of that generation as you said yeah. you know some of the words they have used um, their openness to express what they want Maybe I was fortunate because I had a family that did that yes. uh, for me. So they acted uh, on behalf of the school or the environment. But um, I have to say my father was the principal of the school that, um, that okay, so I you... studied all my life in. So okay. he, he was the founder of a school called Riyadh Schools. It was the first school that emulated the American system yes. uh, in the U.S. So after he was a cultural attaché in the U.S., he came back and they asked him to create a model school to emulate uh, a system that they believe worked, uh, extracurricular activity, um, starting English at a very early age, mm -hmm. like uh, at KG1. This is probably where my English you know, really yes. came from. 
and uh, and he wanted to transfer that concept as well in the school. So I was fortunate with my school and with my family. That's fantastic. So it's yeah. a it's a very big uh, generational you know gap. Yes. But uh, in reality, if you have a good support system, it doesn't matter how far back. It was. If you have a good support system, a family that understands um, what it would take for you to grow, yes, then you know some yeah. people get homeschooled and uh, and they do extremely and well. They do extremely well. Absolutely. All right. So we're at the point where you you're getting headhunted. Um, I guess what was the, your thought process when you were headhunted and why they were looking for you and what made you decide to move on. Um, I was in the National Guard Health Affairs and then I got a call and at that time, um, you know, I was, as I said, completely content, uh, but I also have um, a streak of curiosity. So yes. when I got the call, uh, they said that um, you were being approached by Kingdom Holding Company. It's an investment company and I knew some something about Kingdom Holding Company, but when they said the chairman of the company is uh, His Highness Prince Arulid bin Talal, then my sort of my aerial, you know, uh, alert system went up and I, because I was always following his steps and I was a big fan of what he did and how he was able to, um, you know, uh, create a, um, how do I say? A, 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 remarkable, a remarkable print, right? Yes, exactly. Globally. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I was interested and intrigued. So they said, uh, this job is uh, for Kingdom Holding Company and you might meet His Highness. So I honestly, uh, and if he's watching, I went out of just sheer curiosity. I did not want the job. I just wanted to meet this man that, you know, I, you know, I, I read about in newspapers, foreign and uh, local, and uh, was uh, a fascinating uh, human being. And I went there and um, I was really surprised that I met him directly. So the interview was with His Highness, which I, I can understand now because he really, um, his team is his family. So he wanted to really make sure that uh, not only a person uh, can deliver on um, on the job, yes. but that uh, that person really can be a part of a bigger family. Yes, that they don't stand out, they don't stick out, that they are um, uh, they have the same values, yes. the same way of life, the same uh, you know uh, aspirations. So it's about the character and the job. That's mm -hmm. why he likes to do the interview himself. Can I ask you before you go further? Tell can me. I ask you because? Finding yourself with your potential boss or going to a job interview is nerve-wracking for millions of people. And they're just meeting generally pretty ordinary folks. Yeah. You end up in a room with one of the richest men in the world. Do you remember your feelings before I guess the conversation started? So here is where it gets a bit strange. Okay. Because I was very happy with my job. Yes. I had a ton of courage. Because I didn't want yes, any job, just I just wanted to stay. I was to... going out of curiosity. So because I had that much courage, I sort of, you know, just said yeah, I guess anything I want. I, I started asking questions. Yeah. So what what drives you? You know, it was it was more of me asking as well questions, and um, you know, maybe this is what um, really resonated because yes. uh, he, I was not informed of what the job is until the interview finished. With Interesting. His okay, so he was do uh, so he was he doing was, a character assessment exactly. in essence. Yeah. So I guess a combination of my courage that is driven by no, my non-interest in the job, uh, together with what he is looking for, um, I just checked that box that he was looking for a head of communication to lead the communication efforts of the foundation of the at that time it was not Al Walid. Um, uh, it was not Al Walid Philanthropies, it was Kingdom Foundation. Um, it was a much smaller operation than it was than it is today. So they have now a, a huge, massive team led actually by a very good friend of mine, uh, Princess Lamia bint Majid. She's the Secretary General. And um, but at that time, it was to head the communication of His Highness 
and the strategy of communication, as well as Kingdom Holding Company. And I, I guess he saw something in me. Yes. Uh, and this is exactly what he was looking for. So um, uh, no, then I, I got nervous when, okay. they, <laughs> when he told me. Uh, Once he told it, you, okay. Yeah, it's uh, because, as I said in the beginning, you know, when the stakes are too high, yes, you really need to look at things. I mean, this is a person that has global recognition, that meets with heads of state and kings and uh, presidents. Um, he has, his, you know, he has created a name for himself. Um, he is well respected in the business. Um, uh, sector yes. uh, with his business acumen so I felt am I able to do this job mm. you know you question yourself uh, am I able to do this job am I able to you know um, carry on what was already uh, something that was obviously working for yes. him but also to grow it and not just be comforted with that what he already has but to also take it to the next level mm. and um, but I said, you know, uh, I reminded myself of my own attributes. Of, yes. I reminded myself of what I'm good at. And I started compartmentalizing the job with what I'm good at. And yes. I said, you know what? I, can I believe I can. Mm. I'd like to ask you two questions. Mm. Because what you said in terms of having the confidence going in there and asking questions reminded me of advice I've given plenty of folks and that is when you're going for an interview remember that it's a two-way street remember that as much as you would like to get the job it's also important for them you know to, to want you but it's you know there are attributes they're looking for and there are attributes you should be looking for and in order to also cut through the noise because say for example if a CEO would like to meet individuals from a short list of 500 individuals they will probably see four or five you got to cut through the noise from 500. You got to cut through the noise from the four or five if you're in the final segment. How do you stand out if most people are going to go in there and just answer questions? And so one of the things I've taught successfully to many of these executives who ended up landing big roles was ask questions. Now find out about the person because they will give you all the answers. Yes. And then you can then further on your answers based on their answers. I'm curious to know what were maybe a couple of questions you asked. If you remember. Um, so I remember uh, His Highness' vision um, was very clear. He wanted to empower Saudi women. And that resonated with you? And that really resonated with me. I mean, I was sold the minute, you know, with his vision. I, I, I loved what he was saying. So um, he said, my mission is to do that because I believe, and this where it really resonated even more. He said, I believe that men and women can both do the job equally well if given the chance and the platform. And I want to be that platform that gives the voice for a woman to reach her full potential. He, he early on said that um, a society that um, keeps um, half of its population idle mm. is never going to thrive. And now we, you know, um, uh, and he wanted to be, uh, he wanted to support the government in their initiative because they also had that vision. So right. he wanted to do his own part of that giving back to society. And um, he wanted to uh, make sure that when there is a senior position, that uh, a female will get an equal chance to present her credentials as well as a man and probably even tilting more towards women to give them an advantage yes and um, by 2000 i joined in 2005 by 2007 uh, the ratio was 49 uh, percent men wow and 51 percent female a figure across the board from senior positions wow. to supporting roles it's yeah kind of unheard of and i think even and this was back then yes even if those figures were considered today i think a lot of people I mean, will, will incorrectly assume today i mean to have that kind of balance uh, we had a lean team wow. so we were not a, you know a, a 3000 or 2000 employee yes. it was a lean operation we believed in working smart, not hard. Of course, and, uh, to really, as it should uh, be. And to really have 
one ultra efficient employee better than three regular uh, employees. Yes. So uh, this was always the idea. But um, going back, I asked if uh, I asked him, uh, what does woman empowerment mean? Mm-hmm. How is he going to translate it into an actionable, uh, you know, uh, policy? So more than just uh, mere words. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it just you know, uh, fitting the profile of a woman, or is it a woman that is accountable? and bring something to the table. Mm. And I remember at that time he said, well, I'm a businessman. So regardless, man or woman, if they don't do their job, they're out. <laughs> so, you know. You don't uh, get results, you're fired. Exactly. Yeah. I asked about the company. I've, I've done obviously my homework. Yes. I never go to an interview or a meeting without doing my homework. Yes, so, it's, uh, it comes across that you, you prepare yeah. in advance. But I wanted to see his own insight on yes. certain things. So, it, um, and then I was, you know, uh, uh, approached for the job in specific to head communications. And honestly, um, I ascribed to what he believes in. And mm. I felt like he has the means and the heart and the um, financial gravitas to be able to put this really and to make it a tangible reality. Yes. Uh, just by me not having. Um, the means or the finances, but just becoming a part of that locomotive, I wanted to affect change. Yes. And it felt like this is what I needed to do. Yeah. Can I ask you, because you brought it up about efficiency and then it's better to have one, you know, super efficient person than having three individuals, because this is, should be common sense you know, for companies, whether yes. it's good times or bad times, even in the good times, you should be operating super lean in order to protect for the bad times. Uh, that's something um, our CEO friend, Saeed Al-Gumran al rumeti mentioned, that when times were good, he was on his team about cutting costs. Yes. And they were saying, why? He's like, because trust me, there will be times where this move would help us through. And then when they did go through tough times, they were able to go through it without having to let anyone go because they operated lean for the tough times. Yeah. So my question is, if you were involved in any hiring or from if you weren't involved in hiring and you were just if you were to look at the team what would be the characteristics of these individuals that makes them super efficient so let me take you fast forward a Please. little bit um, when i um, uh, was honored with uh, the position uh, that uh, was given to me which is the director general for the ras al khaimah government media office um, His Highness uh, Sheikh Saud, the ruler of Ras Al Khaimah, his vision was very clear. Um, it was the same concept get the right people to do the right job because mm. we have a big story to tell and we need to do it the right way. But also, Hiba, be very mindful that I want to empower the youth and I want to open opportunities. So create your core team, but also be agile and flexible to bring in um, younger generations and help build them up to be better communicators. And I think that is the perfect way to see it. It's not being too stringent and only about uh, cost efficiency and cutting. It's yes. all, it's, it's really delivering on what you need to deliver with a core team that really gets you to get things done. Mm. But also, you have a responsibility towards the community to build your own community. Absolutely. So now that I am doing what I'm doing and I'm seeing through his wise vision, this is what he wants, I, I really ascribe to the fact that, yes, companies should look at a lean formula, Yes. but also find a way to um, to give job opportunities. Yes. You know, times are not easy. You yes. have to open up. You have to find ways where you can, you know, uh, maybe, you know, against for a company against some of the profit. You know, creating jobs is yes. a part of the. You're giving back to the society. And you're grooming future leaders, which exactly. is what this country has been amazing Absolutely. at doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, so. To your question, you said, what are the things I'm yeah, looking for? Yeah, what characteristics would you say is, is common amongst these individuals, whether it's a fine-tuned skill, 
Is it an ability? Is it an attitude? Is it a combination of them? I really look at three things um, in the character before yes. I look for what are the credentials of that person. Um, I look for a person that has social intelligence, a person that knows how to read a room, a person that knows how to read a situation, mm -hmm. uh, because communication is about that. Yes. So this is a character that you either through trial and error, you become that or uh, you are born. It's it's in you yes. to be able to have that kind of um, sense. sense and sensibility. Um, also, the ability to want, I want to see in the person in front of me that they always want to learn more because mm. um, when they want to learn more, they'll always, it will reflect in the kind of work. They'll do their due diligence, they'll research, they'll read more, they'll educate, they won't be stuck in a comfort zone. Without so being I told. Yes. Yeah. So I want someone that really wants to grow with an organization. Because these are the ones that are actually going to push your organization. Yes. Um, and they will do so when you're not there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think the third is the level of comprehension. Okay. How do people... How does the person in front of you, um, when you give them, them a task, so you know, I would give hypothetical tasks, how they go about it, what yes. are the things that they, you know, they structure, I would say, what, how, what would be, when you are given a task, what would be the first thing you do? Because it really shows how different people tackle things differently. Yes. But there are things that are standard, how you time manage yourselves, how you prioritize, how you um, not lose sight of the message or the core objective. So this also um, allows me to see how that person is going to process information. Um, will that person take... Um, a month and then hit the street running or mm -hmm. is that person going to take a good three, four months and remain at a mediocre stage? Mm. Regardless, by the way, of what um, is their degree because... Yeah, uh, I was going to say that we because, haven't even got to, their, yeah, to the um, degree part, right? It is important. Yes. You said in the beginning there is going to be a 500 CVs. Yes. You need to look at the highest performers. Yes. Because otherwise, you know, um, you're opening yourself up to just um, wasting their time and your time. Yes. You have to really narrow down who seem like a good candidate. Uh, how how is their career path? What have they were able to accomplish? Um, and is that what you look for? Let's say if it's coming through to you, I, you looking it, for it, achievements? It's just partial. Yes. Because I can have a person that has a three PhDs. Yes but um, does not have common sense. Yes. And that really doesn't work with me. These three points that you mentioned, they're powerful points. How do you pick them up? Do you have specific questions that you ask? Um, Over how long? Is it, a, is it just a 15-minute meeting that you have with them? It's really a conversation. Okay. You know, um, you talk. Uh, I'm, I'm, I read the situation well. Yes. I read. I'm good at reading people. We were talking about that yes. uh, earlier. Yes. How to be able to penetrate. So you'll you'll find different characters. Um, the standard is not one size fits all. Yes. You have to see the person in front of you. They'll give you the way to start asking the questions. Yes. They'll guide you. Yeah. The if you're reading the signs well, yes. they'll guide you how On to, to ask. What, what to ask. Yes. The reason I ask is because I listen to podcasts of mm. you know great individuals and I don't know where I got this from, but... One of the things that when I was listening, a couple of folks were saying part of them being able to filter people quickly was they would ask a couple of questions. One was, why did you, know, or why did you leave the previous employment? Mm -hmm. And if the person would complain about that place, that was out. Mm -hmm. But maybe they have a valid point. Right. But what they were looking for is they were looking for a specific kind of mindset where they might where they would say, it wasn't working and I felt that for me I wanted to grow. It's, it was their approach of the situation. So they were looking for people who were able to say they weren't using the blame game. Oh yes, I mean that... They were using the lens. But yeah, the lens, yeah, the yeah, mindset. Yeah, that definitely comes in the conversation. Yes. If you have someone that, you know, everything in life and everyone is against him and or her and, you know, I don't know why this is happening yes. to me and I'm hoping that it doesn't happen when I come and work with you. Perfect candidate. Not. <laughs> not this is not. where you say, well, thank you very much for your time. Yes. Uh, 
No, of course, this person has to, you know, when you mentioned, when we talked about social intelligence, it also uh, is a good indicator of how they're reading you. Yes. So um, yes, well if, they, if they are coming in a room and they want that job, they will put their best, uh, you know, self forward. Yes. How they read the room, some people might assume, oh, I see that person, uh, maybe I should show her that I'm, you know, determined. Yes. And they come across very aggressive. Yes. Which is a character that probably won't work with me. Mm. So that kind of um, uh, reading a situation or room is very important. Yes. You can't, maybe it would work with somebody else, but you have to also read the situation uh, very well from the other side in. Mm. Get inspired. Imagine if you could present yourself, your thoughts, and your ideas with clarity and confidence. Imagine if you could speak to influence and impact. Imagine if you could communicate like a commanding and charismatic leader. Well, you can given the right information and the investment of effort from your end. How do I know that? As a public speaking coach, I work with CEOs, world leaders, and presidents. And when they hire me, they expect nothing short of results. And over the years, it's been two decades now, two challenges have risen for me being unable to help the majority of people. I'm usually on a plane, with the majority of my time being booked a good year or two in advance. And my one-on-one -on -one session to work with someone in person generally starts at $20,000. So we solved the problem by making my public speaking course available for you online. Everything that I teach my clients when I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, thoughts, tips, strategies, how to do things, all on video, all sequenced in the right order for you to be able to watch, re-watch, Practice and refine your presentation, your speaking, and your overall communication skills. And guess what? You will get results. Now, you can have this course not for the $20,000 that my clients pay me when we work one on one. You can have it for $9.97. That's right, just $9.97. You might be thinking, well, why are you offering something that you charge $20,000 for for $9.97? It's simple because those who want to work with me one-on-one -on -one will still hire me. But for many whom I might be out of their budget, this is a great way to develop their communication skills, to cut through the noise, to rise above the rest, and to beat their competition. If you're serious about wanting to develop your skills, to be able to present your thoughts, your ideas, and yourself with clarity and confidence, to be able to speak, to influence and impact, and to communicate like a confident and charismatic leader, then this course is for you. Go on to kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash course and get started today. The, the thing that one of the challenges that also faces, we, we said this um, off camera at, at the start as well, was the fact that um, overconfidence is an issue. You have a lot of folks who will come to the table and they'll sell you the earth, the moon, the sun, the solar system, the whole thing. And then, I don't know if you've experienced the case or, you know, I've heard of um, friends who've experienced it. Um, they join, they don't deliver. How have you learned, perhaps, or, or developed that kind of innate skill to be able to reduce this? Because you, can't, you can never get it at 100%. Yeah, you, you learn the hard way. You, you do learn the hard sometimes. way, yeah. Uh, but um, you need to also look at, uh, you have to give hypothetical scenarios, mm -hmm. as I said. You need to ask the right questions. How would you deal with this situation? How would you? So that, through certain questions, yes. you're able to see um, what is the level of um, understanding yes. um, uh, on a certain topic or subject or method. Mm. You know, I can come and talk about anything, but it, I can tell that my level of knowledge in a certain thing is basically based on news or media or clippings that I've read. Mm. It doesn't show deep understanding of mm. what it is. Yes. And so the, the penetrating questions into certain details will show if this person's knowledge is superficial or it's actually um, from experience, from experience yes. and uh, so on. Um, 
you also have to, um, you know, uh, I, I believe that uh, in Ras al Khaimah as well, uh, you know, uh, uh, the empowering people and putting them in the right positions or empowering organization by having the right people in the organization. Yes. Also comes, there are some uh, tests that are proven. It's, uh, you know... Um, like the Briggs-Myers test? Yes, or... uh, like Hayes or yes. Confrey or, you know, different different organizations where they, they got it um, to a science, basically. Mm. Yes. And uh, psychometric tests. and they, I would not say you have to base your whole uh, decision on that. Mm -hmm. There has to be um, a room for agility. Yes. But they are. They also give you good indicators. Yes. Of how the level of comprehension. How do people process information? Do they? Um, which side of their brain they're using? You're using basically. most. Yes. Um, it also helps. So I would say it's a collective. Um, a collection of everything. Yes. It's not one thing and not the other. And then you've got instincts. You can either have chemistry or not. And um, chemistry is not by being, um, you know, uh, oh, I like this person, or I don't like this person. But how this person, you know, comes Work across. Work with the team as well, yes. right? Yeah. Exactly, because you have to safeguard, and I call it safeguards. You have to safeguard your team. You can't get someone who's, you know, um, just... A go-getter, but mm. at any cost, a go-getter, yes. because that's a toxic environment. Absolutely, and it'll be the case of a rotten apple. Yes, yeah, you've created exactly. this whole bunch, and you, yeah, you throw in a rotten apple. So, is it one thing? It's not. It's really, you know. And then you pray to God that you get it right, <laughs> and then you have probation period, which, which helps. Which so, helps. Uh, so, apart from praying and hoping. <laughs> um, once you've got these talented individuals, I guess both here, you know, with, with your yes. um, current role or even with your previous role at um, K Kingdom Holding, how, do you, how have you found uh, have been the best methods to drive individuals, you know, to be able to create that high performing team? Because I believe the level of success you've had, I mean, uh, your government body was set up only in 2018. And I've, I've personally, I've seen, I've felt the remarkable difference you guys have had here and also, you know, I spent quite a bit of time in the UK. Um, somehow Ras al Khaimah is everywhere. Yes. And that does not happen by chance. And I'm sure it doesn't happen overnight. And it's no one individual. So I know you're the driving force behind it, but you must have a high performing team. And I'd love to know. I'd like to say I'm the only uh, driver. No, uh, it's really the vision yes. of His Highness the Ruler. Absolutely. Um, he uh, has expressed, um, you know, uh, to all government entities of how uh, they uh, should communicate their success because there's a lot of success, but communicate it is, is, you know, is what makes the difference. Yes. And how to put it within the context of uh, the whole vision for the emirate. Mm. So you can't uh, work separately. Yes. Um, you have to work all together. So um, I think uh, the Tourism and Development Authority has done a great job. So they've only made my job easier when yes. I came in. Um, I think that, uh, you know, having, um, having the belief in what you are working for yes. is really the core of everything. significant. Yeah. So I'll tell you, before I get to my team, I'll tell you a story that happened personally to Please. me. Please. So when I was approached as well for this role, um, and I, as I said, I do my due diligence, my homework and everything. And I remember I came, you know, I met first uh, with um, an advisor to His Highness, and he gave me a pretty good idea um, of what the you know, the role entails, but I had done some homework. And then I did, I dived even more when I was interested in the job. I dived even more and did the presentation and, and, you know, looking at different things. And I went and presented yes. in the interview of what I think could work for Ras al Khaimah. Fantastic. Uh, but doing so... Did they ask you to do it or this no. was just something, this was your initiative? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I was going to give it anyway because I really liked the Emirate. Whether I got the job or not, this would have been my contribution to Ras al Khaimah awesome. if uh, you know because I think that it has amazing potential yes and here's the thing when I came to Ras al Khaimah I had done my homework and in my mind I said 
Okay, so Ra's al Khema um, successes and what it has is here, and the perception is maybe here. Mm. So, okay, we close the gap, easy peasy, everybody's happy. Yes. And job done. What I did not expect is that when I went to Ra's al Khema and got to meet all the you know, government entities, the stakeholders, I understood that there's so much more. Ras al Khaimah is here and the perception in here is here. And I thought, okay, this is a bigger role to play because mm. this is now... Um, deeper. First of all, it is, you know, um, Ras al Khaimah does deserve for its story to be told mm -hmm. because they have an amazing thing going on. And also, um, why, why did we reach this gap? Is it the culture of communication? Is it not being able to use uh, the right messages? Um, you know, uh, sometimes you have a success, mm -hmm. but if you put out the success alone, it's like an orphan success, mm -hmm. unless you put it within the context. Yes. So is it lacking a context of the whole movement? Um, and La when I met, lacking good story. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You have to. You have to really tell a story. Mm. Um, and there was a lot done by uh, different entities and they've done it really well and they've already put the strategy. So I came in and I think I came in just in the right time because everyone had their strategy put out. I think it was great. Uh, I built the strategy of Ra's al Khema communication efforts based on theirs because mm. there's no point in everyone working separately. Yes. If it works and it's approved, then we have to all push one another to really reach our foot potential each in their own way. Yeah. Get inspired. You know this by now that we are the number one YouTube show slash podcast that's coming out of the Middle East from Dubai. If you like the idea of having your brand reach at least a million eyeballs per episode, then feel free to reach out to my office on kevinabdurrahman.org. Without further delay, let's continue this great conversation. And I think this is why now you are seeing more of Ras al Khaimah. Yes. Because, yes, the successes were there. Yes, the elements of success are there. But now you're seeing it more weaved in a total move. Yeah, it's uh, quite total, collective yes, in unison total towards total. a vision. Yeah. So, you know, Ras al Khaimah is a place to work, a place to live, and a place, as they say, to play. So yeah. uh, it's, um, it's a great place for uh, businesses to thrive. Yes. Uh, entrepreneurs and uh, seasoned industries. Uh, its geographical location is so strategic, almost like the gateway between East and the rest of the world. Mm. And, um, you know, Ras al Khaimah was never um, an oil based economy, so they have diversified their portfolio long before. So they are quite. Um, rooted and seasoned in this. Mm. Um, at the same time, the topography of Ras al Khaimah is amazing. You have the highest mountain in the That's UAE. That's right, Jace, yes. You have the um, 64 kilometers of pristine white beaches, and then you have... The I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you you didn't know that? Yeah. I didn't know that. And the sea. Oh, wow. Yes. That's a so, lot, 64 kilometers. Yes. And you have the most beautiful sand dunes in the, in the area. So you, when you have the highest mountain, yeah. the open sea yeah. and the sand all in one place, like 20 Heaven minute drive Earth. in either direction, yeah. this makes it of such a unique place for whoever, whoever is seeking good adventure because it's becoming really positioning itself as an adventure tourism yes, uh, you destination. Guys have the, the longest the zip longest line, zip line, line right? in the world, yeah. yes. And um, hotels, beautiful hotels. Um, it's really a place to um, relax. Mm. Uh, you know, we don't, uh, in the UAE, this is really the vision. Uh, it is uh, the united front of seven Emirates. They all complement each yes. other. And um, each one has its unique value proposition. Yes. Each one has its own offering. Yes. For example, when you go to Japan, you don't just go to Tokyo. You want to go to... Osaka, you want That's to go right. to Hakone, Kyoto, all of those because they make different. up Japan. Yes, exactly. So this is how the UAE is. Yeah. I mean, we have uh, an offering of serenity, beach, uh, mountain, um, you know, mountain activities. Uh, the new year was fantastic. Yes. It, uh, it was an amazing display and show. And it actually had the... Um, 
a never done before technology, which is uh, having 200 drones carry the fireworks. Wow. So this was never done before. This is what we got also our Guinness, uh, one of the Guinness records on. Interesting. So that technology was amazing. So we always push the limit. We always want to do more. Um, I heard it was a lot of fun. I wasn't there, but I heard it was also. A lot it's of fun. a very yeah. safe environment. There is a mindset that's driven by His Highness that uh, you are there to make people feel safe and protect them. Mm. So that mindset mindset really translates itself in how you feel there. You yes. feel safe. You feel you know uh, that there is a place that you feel comfortable with your kids around, living there, uh, connected to all the other Emirates. And this is why I ask about the uh, high performing team. On, oh, how, on how you do it. No, 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 that's okay. Because I'll, <laughs> they I'll have ask to you this. Believe in yeah, all of I'll, that. I'll, I'll yeah. ask the second question because it was. Uh, this is what I wanted to lead into it. Your team, you know, the um, the, the, the the government organization. Mm -hmm. What you guys are doing is absolutely amazing, because you're dealing with over a couple of hundred countries. You're dealing with thousands of cities, and they're all bombarding the same eyeballs, the same attention, the same pockets. How are you able to, this is the second question, then you can answer whichever you like. How are you able to cut through all that noise? Because you have done so, and I'm sure that there's still huge rooms to grow, but you have evidently done so in the space of a couple of years, cut through the noise. And that's, that requires a high performing team, that requires skill, that requires Okay. I'd love to know what so it I'll, requires. I'll, so I'll answer the first question okay. first because <laughs> once you get me started on Ras al Khaimah, I get so excited. I see and, that. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the team also is equally excited. Yeah. So they saw what I saw. And they, it's almost like, but it's not fair. Let's, you know, Ras al Khaimah should be known more to the world because it has all these amazing things. So they're doing it from a sense of purpose yes. rather than I'm doing a job. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's literally whatever drove me to do it is driving them to do it as well. It has that you know, magical thing about it that you see it and you're like, but why, why don't people know about it? We need to put, it, put this yes. out. Yeah. It's almost a sense of you know, uh, uh, it's my duty. urgency, yes. duty, yeah. sense of yes, responsibility. Yes. Um, now, how do we find ourselves with, you know, with the noise? I think, you know, you cannot compare traveling habits and the volume of travel all around the world. Yes. There's enough for everyone. Yes. I don't want to do the same place three, four times when I travel, for example, as a tourist. I want to have um, a good uh, understanding of different areas, different cultures, different things. So um, in the sense, uh, Ras al Khaimah, uh, from a tourism perspective, uh, has, as I said, a unique topography. You are able to enjoy um, five-star hotels, beautiful hotels. Uh, you are able to um, uh, enjoy the mountains. If you, it depends on your appetite for adventure yes. or exercise, um, water activities. You know the sand. It's just, it's a beautiful, calm, peaceful place, and. Um, uh, we are attracting more tourists every day. I mean, we have had um, our 1 million plus target met. We, we had put it at 1 million for 2019. Uh, and we have went exceeded above that, that, exceeded that. Excellent. Uh, now our target is for 3 million tourists by 2025. Um, and I believe we are going there because there's a will and effort and vision to enable uh, Ras al Khaimah to reach that target. But also, um, what are the unique value propositions for Ras al Khaimah for business? Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's a place where uh, it's thriving. It's been um, rated by Fitch and Standard and Poor at an A rating. Mm -hmm. um, the economy is quite diversified uh, and the performance is you know, um, meeting the objective of the Emirates. So this is a place when you are looking to open a business or to seeing how you want to um, position your business, you look at all these indicators. Yes. You know, as you said, the world is over commoditized and the offerings are so many. So you have to see, do I want a life 
work balance. Mm -hmm. So I, do I want to get my family to this um, emirate to enjoy different things in it, but at the same time, my job has a place to thrive and to grow. Mm -hmm. um, it also is geared by the kind of business that I'm in. So sure. we are very attractive for you know SME, uh, SMEs, uh, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. uh, where they feel like their business can grow. And um, I think a lot of people tell me the way uh, the serenity of life there yes. is really captures them. Yes. I have uh, one of my team members, They uh, she moved from Dubai to um, Ra's al Khaimah. She loved her time in Dubai and she had oh, you know, a great time uh, in the time she was there. But she says there's something about Ra's al Khaimah. She says, I came and I'm able to have you know a villa in the Mina Al Arab uh, on the um, on the beach yes and so my life has gotten a you know uh, um, how do i say it? a lift yes because i'm able to save um, the money that i would have you know if i had i wanted the same setup maybe in another uh, area or yes. another emirate it would have costed me much more this way i'm getting it so my life is Almost Her quality of life has gone elevated. up. Yes. Uh, she says, I spend much more time with my kids, quality time on the beach. You know, um, I, I still go to Dubai every weekend. I go to Abu Dhabi. Uh, but as a place to live, she says, I am so happy and so comfortable. She is a person that um, speaks what others also keep on telling me. So yes. I've heard it from different areas. I personally live in Dubai. I don't live in Ras Al Khaimah uh, because, uh, you know, I have certain commitments sure. in Dubai. Uh, but if the, if you know, if my commitments are done and I'm able to move to Ras Al Khaimah, I probably would not hesitate. Mm. It's really grown on me. It's uh, beautiful. The people are so generous, kind. The people are lovely. Yes. Really kind. Yes. I mean, the people of the UAE are lovely. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's just really beautiful. I guess I'd like to narrow in on the angle of storytelling. Are you dealing with boards? Are you dealing with, you know, in, you, you, you hold seminars? Say, for example, if you do it in the UK or, you know, in any other countries that you're focusing on. How are you delivering that message? Because from what I understand, I mean, with Kingdom Holding, you helped with the IPO. Uh, here, you you're getting more people to come through. You've smashed through the million and you know, hopefully you'll smash through the three million a lot sooner than 2025. That require, requires a level of storytelling that's sticky, mm -hmm. you know, where you're able to paint the picture and it stays with people. So they know about Ras Al Khaimah. Let's say if they plan to go to Tokyo and Osaka this year, then maybe they'll go to Ras Al Khaimah next year because it's stuck in their mind. I'd love to know how you, you, know, how, how you portray that story. It's... Um... It's not an exact science. Yes. You have to you have to really first of all see um, what are the key messages that you want to deliver. You yes. have to see uh, what is the best way to deliver that message. So it's not one size fits all. Yes. A message that might resonate in the UK might not resonate in the US and vice versa. Um, you have to also um, reach out. Uh, see a lot of people wait on a reactive mode. Yes. I like to reach out. I like to reach out to a whole organization and an organization is is just that it's an organization but it has people in it people who are looking for the next story on tourism or people who are looking at the next business uh, opportunity mm -hmm. so it's very important that i also do my homework and see where my story is relatable where they can actually where i can um, raise enough interest for me to be on their radar screen. Yes. Um, I need to uh, tell Ras Al Khaimah. I'm, I'm not shy uh, about reaching out because I have a good story. Yes. So um, there's so much to say, but it's just I need to make uh, a meaningful approach uh, to this yes. because. Um, it has to be it specific has to, be, to the audience. It has to be specific to the audience yes. and specific to the interests of that media organization. Who is, um, you know, for example, a certain media would have a list, top 10 adventure uh, places you want to go. Maybe they'd have me on that list had they known about me. Yes. That's so you're on not me. You're not waiting and hoping that no, they will find out. No, that's on me. Out. I need to 
explain that. Yes. Then, of course, it's their prerogative whether they find it newsworthy or not. Sure. But if I don't reach out, so there's no ego there. Yes. I have to reach Fantastic. out. I have to call them and tell them, you know what? Check us out. I'd like to come meet you. I'd like to tell you more about it. It's not a quid pro quo. It's just we're here. And a lot of the media are really open to this and uh, and they're happy to do that because they don't get a lot of people reaching out to them and they're waiting, you know, to be sort of people are waiting to be found by the media. Yes. And um, I think also in the Middle East, that wasn't a culture of reaching out to the media and to uh, and to talk and speak. And, you know, you have to you have to accept criticism as it comes. Yes. But also you have to. Put, do your best to balance out the story. Yes, there are areas that you know require adjustment or things that we were, we are working on. But did you also know that we had this and this and this initiative? Yes. You know, most of the time, uh, these that part of the information they don't see it. So it's also a part of my job to um, listen. We're here. This is what we do, and you know, hope for the best. When you're overseas, I guess perhaps here we're getting used to seeing um, great women doing great things. When you're overseas and you're doing these great things, is there ever the assumption, you know, do they believe that you're a Saudi woman doing what you're doing? Have you um, ever you encountered? It's, um, I think, I think that uh, now, of course, um, you know, Maybe maybe back in 2005, yes. uh, things were a bit different when I started. I, uh, you know, uh, I, they would see me, they would assume, for example, that I'm educated in the US or the UK or abroad, and I would tell them. So certain elements of my story would shock them. You know, they, they would be surprised that I'm from Saudi Arabia. They would be surprised that I am. I've never been educated outside, but yet I speak the language and I'm able to communicate with them. Yes. Um, you know, the women are um, happily surprised of maybe the way I, you know, um, rep- present myself and present my country. Yes. Um, that they haven't seen much of that happening. So um, I always tell them uh, and I always make initiatives to sort of, when I travel sometimes, make a woman in media dinner. So I always start by telling them, you know, Let's talk about what um, the the geographical location of each country. But as soon as we start talking about the differences, remove that first layer. You're going to find the layer where we're all the same. We have the same worries about our kids. We have the same aspirations. We are still arguing of you know from Europe to US to Middle East of uh, women inclusion on the board. So the same subjects. Yes. The minute you remove the first layer yes. of the geographical divide, we're far more divide, common than we realize. Far and, more common. And I think once you reach that point, yeah. the conversation shifts from, "Oh my God, so how how do they do this, or how do they treat you?" Or I, we've heard that this and that happens. Once you remove all of this, and you're sincere in your efforts and what you are, and you don't try to sugarcoat it, just sure. say it as it is, but really give the balance that it needs. Mm. You know, the conversation, the ice just breaks. Uh, the next thing I'm talking about, how I'm struggling with my son and his gaming. And then the next lady on the table will say, oh my God, I, I can't make him stop. So all these things, it's no longer just about where I'm from and truth, where you're so from. Yes, we're just humans. Yeah. yeah. Um, since you brought up your son, um, <laughs> let's talk about your son and daughter yes. in whichever order you like. Um, I'd love to know... And perhaps it could be an aspiring parent or a parent, we have one sitting right here, uh, who could benefit from this advice. Um, I would love to know what have you or how have you molded your kids? You mentioned being a helicopter mom. You know, how how much... (laughs) They call me that. I I think I'm just normal. (laughs) Um, You know, how much of it um, has it been you overseeing them or... Have you given them certain freedoms or allowed them to have certain ways of thinking or, you know, kept an area for debate? And also with your daughter doing you know, amazing things, having graduated. And I found it quite surprising for a Saudi woman to graduate and one of her majors being Mandarin and entrepreneurship. Um, you can take it in any direction. But I, I find, I believe that um, I think people who watch or listen, listening to this, they'll find that to be uh, inspiring and useful. 
So I'm the proud mom of two amazing kids. Well, they're not kids anymore, but uh, in my eyes, they are. They will always be, yeah. <laughs> so I have my daughter, Hannah. She's 22. She just graduated from university in the States, um, and now she's working in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mohammed, he is a thriving 14-year-old, um, well-adjusted uh, kid. Yes. And uh, even though he lost his dad um, at age six years old, but Sorry uh, that. Um, it was it was uh, a big, you know. Uh, I looked at it almost like, how am I going to? Uh, go through this um, and explain life to him without the other side. But Fill the void, yes. I have yes. to say that, um, you know, if you are a parent that just doesn't, it's not a perfect scenario. You can't get everything right. It's not a mm. book or a manual. Yeah. You just lead with your heart the same way you lead your team to want better things. You lead your kids to look at the world in a more holistic way yes you inspire them um, I follow my father's footsteps and so many things of um, my father used to ascribe to creating memories um, and let's find ways how we create memories whether mm -hmm. it's in our own house uh, certain games or certain things or whether we travel and we look at different cultures and really bond over these things um, but I have to say, uh, each one of us, we go through a doubt yes. cycle. And I had my own um, uh, sort of um, guilt notions. So when I uh, started um, working, uh, I would leave Hannah at that time for a long stretch of time. Mm. And I was on a constant guilt trip. Oh my God, I'm not spending enough time with my daughter. I'm not seeing her. Um, the, only, the time I come in, I'm too exhausted. So I'm really not all in. I'm, I'm there, but uh, mentally I'm still exhausted from work. What am I doing? Uh, and it was constant. This, that sound just keeps yeah, on going and going. Uh, yeah. And you know, you try to overcompensate in the summer and try to do everything. So you come back more exhausted than, uh, than when you started yeah. off. Uh, the reality is, and this is, this is what I want to tell all parents. Um, one day, um, you know, my daughter really just uh, something changed. Uh, her, the way she looks at things, she wanted things, you know, she wanted to achieve better uh, results. She wanted. She was very determined. She was getting A's and honorary. She was an honorary role, and you know, things just sort of like shifted. Um, uh, she matured and she and she had a good balance between life and school. Mm. So you know, comes the university. She's also doing equally good. She's yes. always motivated. Always want to get into her hands. You know, into certain programs, doing internships. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, bless her. She's really doing well for herself. And then at one point, we were just having a conversation. And um, she said, uh, I told her, Hannah, I'm really proud of you. I, you know, you're really, you're doing really well. You're very, you know, you know what you want. She's like, yeah, because I'm really doing what you were doing. I don't know any different. Yes. This is the way you did it. And this is what I want to do. And um, I want to be like that. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we don't realize in the moment how much others are looking at our actions. And you were, the whole time you I were mean, leading by example. I, I can't tell you, I, I was experiencing different emotions at that time. One was like, why was I guilty all this time and hammering myself for not being there and working? Yeah. And uh, the other part was, say, I was saying, yeah, I should, I should be proud of what I'm doing because actually it's translating in its own way um, and shifting to my kids. What your kids see is what they will want. Um, and, you know, I've always used to tell them as they were little kids, uh, they used to make fun of it. But, you know, it, it really sticks. So since Hannah or Muhammad are so young, you know, uh, since they were at a very early age, just as soon as they start getting, you know, 
you know why we study in school? We study in school to be better people and then we get to high school and then we get good grades and then we get good grades. We get in good universities and we get in good universities and then we get good jobs and we do really good in our jobs and then we can get whatever we want. Nice. So I always used to link whatever they want with that whole well done. thing. That's good. That's good storytelling. That's <laughs> yeah. sticky. It sticks. Yes. Because whatever you tell your kids, they're like sponge. You yes. think they're not listening. Oh, they're listening. But it actually, you know, it will surface at one point or another. Yes. But to to be able to establish in their mind that connection that you have to earn what you get, that you have to, that there's a journey. And yes. that journey, the more you advance in it, the more rewarding it becomes for you. Yes. So that connection of, you know, everyone likes to see, you know, the, the story of the rainbow and there's a pot of gold at the end. Life is like that. Mm. You, you just work hard and you take that rainbow until you reach what you really want to reach. So they, there's like, oh, here goes the story. <laughs> they repeat it. <laughs> and, and, and the cool thing is what makes it a great story or you know your, your methodology is great it's because it's sticky so even if they dislike it they yes, still know it exactly it's like a song it. that you can't get the lyrics yeah. out and you don't really like but you've hooked uh, it in well yeah very exactly. good this is what you want these are the things you need to do yes very good exactly. that's fantastic exactly what an awesome piece of advice so uh you know at the end of the day i think the message to all parents um what you do is everything you do in life uh, is you're, being noticed. You're, you're being you're being monitored, <laughs> noticed, monitored. absorbed. It's, it's, true. it's everything. So, um, and your children will be a mirror of yourself, uh, and you know, it's it. They will never come out exactly as you want them, but they will grow in a direction that um, will be what they want for their life, but at least With they're taking influence. the right trajectory. Yes. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to... Um, and on, sorry, and please. quality yes. over quantity. Okay. So you In what spend, sense? You spend two hours with your kid, but you give him your undivided attention. Yes. Phones out of the room, really just talking, having that, whether you are doing an activity or watching, you know, something on TV, but commenting about it and engaging or going somewhere, you know, for a walk in the mall or a restaurant. It's that two hours that you are connecting. It's better than having five, six hours where you're just, you know, on the phone. You're, mm. you're there, but you're not there. Yes. And they sense it. Yes. Yeah, especially, yeah. I mean, adults sense it, but kids are a lot Listen, more. Listen, we all go through the time where you, you know, you're working, and your kid will tell you, "Mom, just keep your phone away. I want to tell you something." But you know, I'm guilty of that. I'm not saying I'm doing it all right. Yes. But these would be times. Now he also appreciates that I will do it only if I have to. Mm -hmm. I have a responsibility to, um, you know, my team. I have a responsibility to my boss. So I sometimes I cannot. I would love to, but I can't put my phone down. But you're conscious about it, about yes. being actively. But now he says, okay, finish, and then we, mm -hmm. we talk. So he also, because you can't just tell them you're going to switch off. Maybe it's not the right message to send. You're going to sure. tell them you will strive to spend uh, time with them and you're interested in what they have to say. So it's not a task. You're yes. actually interested in what they want, uh, what they say, but they also understand that there's a certain responsibility, and life is like that. You yes. know, it'll throw curveballs at you, and you you'll just have to cope with it. I can't remember again where I heard this, but it, this reminded me of something I had heard over the last year, where they were saying that the mark of good parenting isn't about showing your kids that you're perfect. You know, it's about showing them that you know you're doing your best. Oh no, and they've seen me stress and they've seen me, it's like, oh my God, I don't have time to do this. So they've seen... They've all aspects seen, of you. Yeah, yeah. You can't seen, hide it anyway. Like. No, no, it's not healthy. No. You, you know, uh, because life is not just a fixed plan and yeah. life will throw curveballs at them and they, you know, they are better served if they know how to express themselves well. Yes. Not always be scripted because, yes. you know, they'll still have to deal with it internally. So better externally in the right way mm -hmm. 
then internally and then it starts weighing on them. That's true. Oh, I've got so many questions I want to ask. <laughs> I want to ask because from the outside, it looks like because you've gone from success to success and I'm sure continued success, um, it seems like you haven't had any curveballs. And if you'd be open to sharing in any context, a curveball that, you know, um, maybe a hit you had or a loss and what you went through and how you dealt with it. That's one question. And I wanted to ask the question about how did your daughter get into Mandarin? Like, <laughs> was this a com an advice? You know, did you guys have a talk about it? Did she just say, I'm learning Mandarin? So two separate questions. Yes. Which one shall, shall we deal with? <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, life is not all great, but mm. it's only through the little trials in life that you start appreciating little things. Yes. Uh, you know, like in school, you had to study all week long yes. and then you savor every moment in the weekend. This That's is how life time. is, you know, if you have it all good, and all great, then there's, you, then you're not living life. You're not learning from your own mistakes. You're not living opportunities. I've had, you know, a share of um, challenges. I had things that knocked me so hard, you know, knocked the wind out of me. Yeah. And um, but uh, I, it was not an option. Maybe it's a continuation of what my family had you know, ingrained in me. Yes. It's not an option to fall down and not to pick yourself up again. Mm. Take your time, but come back up. Be your own critic. What, how did this affect you? How can you find the silver lining in there? How can you make it better? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, I guess you get stronger every time. Absolutely. You get more resilient. Mm. Your judgment and how you take uh, how you react to certain situation, hopefully with time gets, gets better. better. Yes, you know, uh, maybe I was I reacted too fast. I was too emotional in my reactions. Now, I've, you know, trained myself to, a not, um, you know, not uh, text anything when I'm angry. Sure. Or yes. Not yeah. Everyone, to have any. Plenty of us are guilty about that. <laughs> not to react. Uh, that when I'm at the peak of my anger, I'm not serving myself well. Yes. Because uh, my thought process is um, is not in the right uh, in its full capacity. Yes. Uh, also, when you're uh, exhilarated and you're very happy. Yes. You can also take wrong decisions Correct. because you know uh, when you are extra happy you feel everything is great but then you take decisions and you're like okay that was not mm. a I good think decision about those things yes yeah. so i think extreme happiness or extreme anger is never a time to take decisions in well said you have to really take a step back say okay let that pass and then revisit Simmer it. On it yeah and it's not easy because you know your emotions are sort of like telling you to do something yes. and your mind is sort of, you know, pulling you back. So I think... Do you have a method like for some, um, you know, um, I've, I've had a chat with a few billionaires and I remember one of them saying that he always sleeps on it. And then the moment he wakes up, he has a feeling and he will go with that, with that feeling. He'll never make a decision. Even if he knows the decision he wants to make, he will still never reply on the decision until he sleeps on it. So literally it was the sleeping on it, whether it was metaphorical or actually physical, yeah. both. He would literally go, I need to sleep on it. Even if I know the decision, if I feel the same way when I wake up, that's the decision. Do you have a, I think, something that I think, worked out I to think be that's your formula? A really, uh, I think you should sleep on it. Just mm. don't sleep forever while it's affecting you. Because it's not good to sleep when you are, you know, worked up about something. Because you're... Please elaborate because on you're, this. Okay. You're, your peace is established when you are in your deep sleep, you're, you're processing your body is re, uh, you know, uh, readjusting itself, uh, recalibrating itself. So you need to also uh, then talk yourself before you sleep that this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. um, primary, you know, initially I'll probably do this and this and this, but let me sleep and wake up, see how. So don't also sabotage your time of sleep because that's the time you need for your, you know, for everything to reboot itself mm. again. 
So That's I don't like I don't like to sleep angry. If I'm if I'm upset, uh, I would distract myself watching a program, mm-hmm. doing something, thinking of solutions, but I won't sleep upset. So I don't know if that's what no, they that's meant, very good. but yeah. probably that's in the physical form. Sure. But I think in the mental form, yes, I absolutely ascribe to that. I think you have to literally, you know, take a few steps back and just sleep on it and look at way out the outcome. Mm. Because what might sound like a brilliant idea yes. would probably have other consequences. And when you are extremely happy or extremely sad, your mind will stop only and will focus on what your idea came up with, you yes. know, your mind came up with. It doesn't look at all the consequences. And then how do you balance the aspect of, you know, following your gut and that kind of like that simmer time and balancing the pros and cons towards a decision? Are you? I'm a, I'm a data person. Okay. So you're more on the I, uh, less gut, more on pros and cons. No, I, no, I'm a data person in the sense that I, Honestly, I use my gut in everything, okay. but um, also I, uh, it's comforting for me to understand the background behind something. Okay. So uh, sometimes my gut will tell me, do this, but then it, had I just stopped and researched it, mm-hmm. probably my gut will tell me something else. Yes. So I need to get all the information, yes. the knowledge, and then use my gut to process it. Well said. I think in essence it's um, going with your gut and not being ill-informed. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You, you know, your gut coupled with the right information. Mm. That's fantastic. To get better and informed decision. Yes, yeah. that's super good. So my daughter and her Mandarin. So Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, when Hannah graduated, uh, she... Um, she really was uh, keen on pursuing law. Okay. And, you know, uh, the UK system, you can study law as an undergrad, and she took a full IB, so she was able to get into the system right away. Um, and in the US, you have to have um, something before you earn a law degree, sort of a bachelor, and then your postgrad would be a law degree. Mm-hmm. Um, I was very happy that Hannah chose the UK and law, so she would be close by and everything. And she actually got, you know, accepted in two renowned universities for a law degree. But then one day, and these are the, some of the curveballs that we're talking about. One day, you're, you know, she came and she said, Mom, what if I study law and it's not my cup of tea? It's not, it's not who I am. It's not, you know, I would have wasted three, four years of my life, and it's not something that I want. So I really believe in the American system where I'll study anything that I want, undergrad, and then if I still have, um, you know, that mindset of a law degree, then I'll continue my education, which automatically meant that she's going to end up in the U.S. Uh, not that I have anything not, against the U.S., but not, she's not just, something a mother wants to hear about yeah, her child. Yeah, she's 13 hours away versus yes. I can, in the U.K., I can just, you six know, or overnight, seven hours, six or boom. seven hours, I can be there. But, you know, you have to, they have to find their own way. And uh, she has given me no reason to um, to worry because, you know, she has, she has been very focused on what she wanted. Mm. She's so, very much, when you're describing her, I've never met your daughter, but when you're describing her, I feel like she's a copy of you. Uh, yes, of... it's uh, a lot of people tell me that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So she, you know, she decided, uh, she said, fine, if I'm going to do a law degree, I need, also everyone wants to be a lawyer, so I need a unique value proposition to be a lawyer. So I need to stand out from the crowd. And she was looking at different things. Um, she was always intrigued by entrepreneurship, so she applied to Babson and in Boston, they're known for their program. But then she came back and she told me there's a program that I am really keen on. It's a very exclusive program. It's a very hard selection, but I'm going to go for it. And I asked her what it was. She said it's in Northeastern University in Boston, and it's an international co-op business with a track, so they give you five languages to choose a track in and um, you you choose a a major so it's a combination of all and I said okay and uh, 
that sounds very interesting. What did you choose? And she said, okay, so here's my choice. It's going to be international co-op business with a track in Mandarin and a uh, major in entrepreneurship. <laughs> Your reaction would be priceless. <laughs> So, you know, you, you never want to be the parent that tells your kid, have you lost your mind? I can't even teach you, you know, a few words in French, let alone, you know, in Mandarin. But of course, you hold that in and you compose yourself. And, you know, you sort of say, but are you sure it's, you know, languages are not for everyone. Look at me. I tried. And, but she, you know, her answer is really what I said, you know what? She needs to do this because she said, Mom, I need to be a part of the change. And the way I see it, China is the upcoming reality of change. So I need to be there when this happens. So, so I was like, Bravo, Hannah. Bravo. Okay. This is what I'm trying to, to you know, tell folks all around the world, on stages all around the world. You know, five continents, bravo to you. Well done. That's amazing. And you know, right then, I, Bravo. you know, she, she, uh, her level of determination and her logic behind it was so compelling that what can you know, you say? I, I can't be the mom that tells her, yeah, but still, no. I want you close by so I can come and visit you. You know, it's it's a time not to be greedy with your own time and just to let them be. Yeah. So uh, she did it, and you know, a part of me I was like. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it was that good idea in her mind, but in reality, you know, it's uh, it's not going to really work out. And they really made it very difficult. So for you to stay on that track, they split the GPA, so the international business on one side okay. and the track on another side. Because the minute you go, you know, below a certain, which is 3.2, which is quite high mm -hmm. in, in Mandarin, then you're off that exclusive program and you have to go so just to So you couldn't just lie on your business, business acumen. You yes. had to develop the language. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so she just excelled and did really, really well. And she loved it. She loved the um, Chinese uh, culture. She took her last year in HKU in Hong Kong University. Okay. She, she says, I'll go there in a second. It's just, uh, she connected it's a great place, with the culture. Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah, she connected with the culture. And uh, now she has a great job in Saudi, and I'm very proud of her. Wow, that is fantastic. Uh, Mohammed, you know, he's, uh, he's a glass half full uh, guy. So yes. he really looks at the best outcomes, and he's not, uh, he's very. Um, is very analytical because he loves science, he loves math, he mm. loves how things work out. He builds his own little computers and he, you know he assembles them. So he doesn't reach his this level just by sheer emotion. Mm -hmm. But he is by character like that. And I believe that's you know Muhammad having seen you over the years. Because I, I don't feel like you're you, you might be a data kind of person, yeah. but you come across as a as a person who looks at the glass half full. I do. Given the I choice, do. you look for the I positive. I don't think there is a better way to live life. Yes. You have to look at things. You have to always find some good in a negative situation. Mm. There, it's always, I mean, you just have to look at it. It's yes. how you, you know, look at things and zoom in on things and really uh, look at, okay, so it happened. I can't change it, but what can I change that, mm. you know, would make it at least you know, tolerable. Yes. Yeah. As a high performer, um, what, what has been your strategy in terms of setting and achieving goals? Do you have any tips that you could perhaps share from your experience that have helped you both set and achieve goals? Because the, the kind of track you're in, uh, what your daughter is doing, these are not things that happen by chance. You need to be quite conscious and active about it. You mean in work or personally? In any aspect of your life whichever direction you'd like to take it you know something that could be useful if someone's watching this and because we hear a lot about goal setting and the importance of having goals but then there is perhaps a couple of things whether there are habits or disciplines that have really helped you um, has it been a vision board has it been you know writing out a list and working off it has it been a thought process um i would say um i i do have a target or a vision mm. but it's there in the back of my mind 
the modus operandi is divide and conquer. So mm -hmm. you put little goals, you achieve them, and you then come to the next stage and the next stage. You have to self audit yourself. So every you know, every day or every month or every year. So every day you're self auditing yourself when you put your head on the pillow and you did I accomplish this? What do I need to do? But then on a you know, frequent basis, it's, it's not really a structured uh, thought process, sure. but uh, you should, you know, a lot of people do a lot of, you know, New Year re resolutions. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, but it's it's sort of your, like your own uh, New Year resolution for your life. Have but, I been on the right track? It's not really, um, your everyday goals are, okay, check, let's do this, let's do this month, this, but your overall uh, look at things Okay, am I better than when I started last year, or am I, um, you know, have I lacked in something and I need to get myself back on track? Mm. Because, as I said, you know, life is so agile, it's so yes. volatile sometimes, and you need to be as agile and as flexible as possible. So the plan allows you to always look at, even if you navigate away, the overall destination. The overall destination. Yes. Um, and you're, uh, you know, you look at your the things that you have achieved. Have you got sidetracked? Mm. Because it's so easy to get sidetracked. Yes. And sometimes you get sidetracked and you see a better path, and mm -hmm. then you recalibrate. So it's not so structured. You have to do you. You have to do what is good for your family, for your circumstances. Everyone has to look at what they want yes and if they feel that what they want is not serving their ultimate goal or that goal change that's okay you don't you don't you can't be hard on yourself mm. or have the ego say you know uh, but i but i'm right and i'm going to push through until i prove i'm right if it's not right it's not right and yes you're just losing time by not acknowledging that mm. so um, I would say maybe my advice is divide and conquer your everyday life but always keep into a path so that if you do get sidetracked for any reason you always know how to come back it's just like a you know a GPS Google map yes you, you know sometimes you take a wrong Absolutely, turn and then it will but then it will recalculate, recalculate. And, yeah and bring you back on track yeah Sorry, can I just ask something? Sure. Have you journal? Do I? Journal? Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I about that. It's seen as, it's, it's seen as a, uh, a traveler doing it, but people don't realize a lot of people. A lot of successful people journal. No, I, I, I got very excited once. Okay. And I made an account on Word, uh, WordPress. I had just come back from Japan and it was a very what a lovely yeah, place. It was eh? a beautiful uh, trip. It was you know it was not work related. I did a lot of reflection. It was just after my father had passed away and I needed somewhere oh, where I can just um, you know think and process. Mm. And I came back and you know I started that diary and writing about it, but taking it from a culinary point of view. So culture and culinary and things and feelings that I have ex experienced. And I did the first one in 2011, <laughs> I think, 2000, no, sorry, 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. <laughs> I don't even know. I can't even remember the password of my account. <laughs> but in my mind, uh, but it's something... I think that uh, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I had a journal. Okay. And uh, you, you seem to be quite conscious, yeah, and I think that's why the question, yeah, exactly. why the question came up was you come across as someone who's very conscious of your thoughts and that whole, yeah. you know, check and balances. Because I, I remember doing a video many years ago where I said I wish we had our birthdays and New Year's resolutions at least once a month. Mm -hmm. Because at these critical moments, we start thinking, yeah, oh man, I did waste that year. If I'm honest with myself, I could have done more. I could have been better, even if I'm so just one So you don't have to wait one year better. to discover exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think so that I the reason, will... yeah. Okay, so as soon as I find my password, I'll... <laughs> you have I shall continue. Me now to... <laughs> In the meantime, I'll <laughs> do pen and pad. No, I just wish I had such a remarkable... Um, uh, time I traveled to places I never dreamt of going 
uh, with my previous uh, position and uh, now I'm you know literally getting exposed to a whole new culture different things and I think you know, I one of a... my resolutions will be this. Yeah. I think I, I do need to. I mean, not only for myself, for my kids. Yes. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. Uh, there is that saying where it says, um, traveling is like a book and those who don't travel are still on the first page, you know, or, or something like that. The, the value of traveling is immeasurable. Yeah. So it's... Uh... I know I know a mother and I thought that was a great idea and I always wanted to put it in my mind that I want to do it. Every you know trial and error, every lesson that she mistake that she has done or lesson she has learned, she would write down a whole list and she says I'm gonna keep building it, building it, building it until my kids are of an age where they can understand and I'm just gonna give them the list. I'm gonna print it out and that's, a good that's my one. two cents on Is that things. similar to the not to do list? Uh, not to do and do. Both. Okay, not to do and do list. Yeah. yeah. Tim Ferriss does a not to do list. Yes. Where he looks at it like, and, and um, they know it's like kind of to avoid these mistakes. These are the things not to do. Yeah. Yeah. And this lady is she online? Has she put no, this no, online? She's, no, no, okay. she's she's a friend of mine. Uh huh. She's uh, just doing and, it offline. And she just was telling me this. What a powerful uh, thing. And she's like Hiba. Um, I told her what. Actually, this is where it really got me. I, I told her, where did you get this amazing idea from? She's like, my father passed away and I wished everything he told me I can remember. Ah. Because it's the way to connect me back to him. It's the way to remember him. And I felt like if, you know, after a long time, if I ever go away, I always want my kids to remember something. And so I'm making an effort to actually write it. You know what? I'm going to do more videos now. Because there are things I want to tell Kareem and then it'll go and disappear. But that way, once I upload them on YouTube yep. or whatever platform will be in a hundred years, yes. <laughs> it could be useful. Wow, that is powerful. Yes, yeah. uh, you don't I, think I didn't about think it that about way, it right? that way. You know, it's, uh, it's something to really think about because these things, later on, sometimes your kid would want to connect with you mm. at the time. You know, I, I have so many memories with my father. May he rest in peace. And rest in peace. These memories really come up constantly but i wish that there was some form of maybe i wish i you know took more video cam of him more you know i, I had my sony camera i should yeah. have yeah. you know documented it's just these moments that yes. pass and at at times where i need strength that i would have loved to recall them bring them back read them yes yeah. wow that, that is so powerful please thank your friend on our I behalf will. Because actually, that, that's really made me think. I'm like, yeah, you're so right. But I need to do it. <laughs> See, we all it's have stopped, things we need to do. It's not there. You know? Yes, I need to do yeah, it. Yeah, we, we all have things we need to yeah. do. Um, this is, you know, I'd really love to know from all the places you've traveled to, what has been the most surprising one? I, I love traveling. I, um, and my next one's going to be culinary. So. I've, uh, I fell in love with Japan. Okay. Um, and my love for Japan started a long time before because um, I used to love watching movies of samurais and shoguns and at that time there was no, you know, there, sometimes there would be subtitles mm. and, uh, but it was on TV or, you know, some, you know, these Betamaxes you, yes, know, you would yes. get. And, yes, I remember But those. I used to love watching them. And I was fascinated with their code of honor and mm. their values and how they did things. And um, and they were so they were so proper. Yes, so, yeah, proper. so proper. And their the way they dressed and the yeah. ceremonies they did. Mm. And then as a teenager, I um, I read a book uh, that also got me very fascinated in their culture and uh, how they are and the discipline behind their life. Um, and then I got interested in food, you know. And they are really, you know, I, I didn't realize when I went to Japan that there are 33 three Michelin star restaurants mm. there. So that combined is all of probably, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know the numbers, but that's a really big number. Yes. Do you, and it's do you not enjoy that, like cooking? It's not a Michelin star. Yeah. Um, a Michelin star is amazing. Yes. But the street food is equally amazing. Yes. So it's just 
the whole um, culture and the precision they have yes. and how they put something. I mean, everything is studied. It's, uh, I think this is really what uh, I admired so much yes. um, about their culture. It really stands out. Their mindset, their attitude. It it's really become does. It's a cultural thing. Yeah, you can see that everything is done really does. well. And um, it's just beautiful. And uh, so that is a place that was very close to my heart. I think maybe um, you... Yeah, maybe a place that really surprised me or uh, I it was it took me much more to process than I thought so um, in back in 2000 and I want to say six 2006 I went with uh, His Highness uh, Prince Walid to a trip to you know uh, different countries in Africa okay they were the probably um, the, the countries that were struggling the most. So mm-hmm. it was in the capacity of the foundation in Africa. So we, I went to different places, Liberia, Guinea-Bissau, Côte d'Ivoire, Mali, Niger, Nigeria. Um, I mean, so many, uh, so many places and at the same time. And it really humbled me, mm. you know, to see what's happening there, uh, to see the unbelievable potential of what this continent brings and how they are struggling, but they're still very proud people and they're trying to get uh, their life back mm. uh, from, you know, uh, uh, people or regimes that have abused them over the years. And uh, and at that time, you know, we were going through different places, orphanages, we had, uh, um, you know, uh, with the Carter Foundation in, um, in for example, Guinea-Bissau, we had uh, a collaboration to eradicate the Guinea worm um, in different areas. So each place had its own uh, unique features, but also their own unique needs, mm. depending on, you know, what, how they, uh, how, how much they suffered and what really is their priority list. And, um, and I remember that, uh, I remember two things from this trip. I remember I asked His Highness at that time, I said, you know, why do you need to go yourself? Why don't you send the whole, you know, division of the foundation? And he's like, because it's very important um, for me to have my feet on the ground and to really understand um, how the rest of the world, that it's not all just business and Mm. money, that it has a lot of challenges and that I can actually engage engage with them and see how I can affect change. Mm. But for me, it took me much longer to recover because what you see affects you on such a deep level and you feel so small uh, in front of all these problems. You feel like, oh my God, I'm living life and I'm living really well and yet they can't you know the a mother is thinking i have five kids i have to send my eldest uh, to work and not to school because he has to support his other kids and then she has to measure which one has dinner that day and which one doesn't and has Mm. to wait for it's just and you're thinking that is such a great disconnect from my life and what I'm doing. Well, we don't think about having and to drink water. Exactly. So these little things. Now, of course, human nature kicks in after sure. a while, right? You come back, you're depressed, and then you start recovering, and then you start immersing yourself in everyday life. And then, you know, it, it's there. But again, this is a part of the self-audit. Yes. What am I doing? Am I doing something? I remember um, at one point uh, the... Um, Someone from the UN came uh, for um, for the food. Uh, um, I I can't remember exactly which entity, but uh, the bottom line is they put it into numbers. If you give uh, like three hundred dollars for a month to one person, that will be able to sustain him for one thousand two hundred calories per day and for a month. Mm -hmm. When you put things into that context, because it's so overwhelming, but when you when you really bring it and chop it down to the basics, it is really quite doable. Yes. Yeah. And again, it's the way you say it. You're not going to change everything. Yeah. But you can cut through the the noise. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, Since you mentioned calories, I thought about energy management. (laughs) How do you manage your energy as an individual who is busy? 
and she's got things to do and her attention has been taken from different directions. Perhaps how do you say yes or no to things or how do you manage your time, energy? Divide and which... conquer again, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I, uh, I, try to, um, I try to exercise. Yes. So there's the will there yes. as much as I can. I actually, the good intentions are actually, there. Um, I, I was much more, um, you know, I kept a schedule of exercising. So the same way you would schedule a meeting, yes. you would schedule that. That's the yes. only way it's going to happen. Well, yeah, uh, that's funny. It reminds me of Firas. Interesting. It's the only way. You okay. block it on your calendar. It's yes. a meeting, so everybody knows that this is your time to exercise. Yes. But, you know, uh, the thing is, you go off track, you bring yourself back in again yeah. so uh, I, I prioritize I look at things I can't do I can't be everywhere doing everything for everyone mm -hmm. so I need to prioritize what are what are the things that have a sense of urgency and have a time limit I start with those and then I do a must-do list and a want to do list yes. and it'll be nice to do list so and that's how you, <laughs> I you break it down yes. I know you like to read books I do, I do. Um, I mean, I like uh, books that have a lot of facts, uh -huh. uh, real life events in yes. them, and then weaved in them a fictional story. Okay. Is like, there a... you know, like the Da Vinci Code. Uh -huh. It was like a, oh my God, and I kept on Googling the paintings and things. So I like things that, I love a writer that really does their research really, really well, mm -hmm. but puts a really engaging story within it. So you're enjoying the story and the events of the story. Yes. But at the same time, you're indirectly getting all that information um, instead of just reading a, a book about a certain country or a certain culture or a certain era. Yes. You're getting it through an entertaining way. That's my favorite kind of read. That's very cool. History is so important. Uh, and I, we learn a lot of lessons from history. But if I, it's not my thing to read just uh, accounts of history being made. If you put it for me and package it in a way where I'm getting all that information anyway, because the writer, and it's very important that the writer really does their homework. So this, I think, is the difference between a good writer mm. and uh, a writer that really did not pay so much attention. Because I will take um, that, um, you know, these parts of historical information as he gives it to me. Yes. So it is the writer's responsibility really to get the right information. Um, but for example, but also yeah. for me to research who the writer is and not just read anything. Yes, you know? like one of the things I was told because I was late to the, to the reading game and then I kind of got onto it in my early 20s, which is you know, quite late and I'm glad my nephews are reading at the young age that they are, was when someone told me by reading a book, you get someone's 50 years of experience, you know, summarized down to a weekend and you can be the kind of person if you read their books to have that kind of wisdom without having to live 50 years and that got me thinking oh i like that idea is there an aspect of reading books that i think uh, there's definitely an aspect to that but also there's so many books yes okay and you need to declutter <laughs> you know information yes. so uh, you need to look at what are the books that what are you looking for in a book uh, what type of writer because you don't want to also spend you know your time on a book that y you are struggling to move pages along yes you know this has to really check all the boxes so uh, if you are reading and the first chapter does not give you any reason to jump into just drop it. the next just drop it really yeah. <laughs> Uh, because there's so many resources of how to get information. Yes. A book can really draw you in mm. or can really just halfway through, you end up not really absorbing all the information because you're not enjoying the read. Yes. It's, it's a journey. You're going through a journey with uh, whoever writes. Even, even nonfiction books, there are ways how you present a certain theory, how you draw comparisons, how mm. you give examples that are very um, enticing and you know, uh, but if you just read and read and read for the sake of it, yeah, it won't stick. No, I used to tell myself off mentally, why aren't you reading the book? But then over the years, I realized, hey, for whatever reason, I'm not connecting with this book, even though it's a business book, even though it's a marketing book and I, I want to learn. And that's this is what I'm normally gravitating to. 
I realized there are just some authors that I connect with. I like Malcolm Gladwell as a writer. I just love his style. Uh, you know, I love Dave Trott. You know, I like Mark Manson. Their style is witty, it's funny. I'm like, oh, I love how he delivered that line. And I find myself engaged in it. Yes. That works for me. You might not like it. My brother might not like it. And it's important. If, like you said, you're going through a journey. So yeah. why would you go down a journey where you dislike? Like, don't, there's no point forcing yourself. Exactly. Is there a, um, a quote or, a gu- or um, you know, something maybe you've read or you've seen somewhere, or maybe it's a guiding philosophy that you live your, your life by? Um, there's one thing that I really feel that is guiding me. Yes. Um, my father said he once um, heard it from someone or read it somewhere, but he said that uh, if you are the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Yeah. So if so you good. can't, if you can't. Uh, learn something yeah. if, you, if there's no added value to you then you you're not in the right place mm. equally i think that um, you have to listen more than you speak yes because what you say is information that you already know but what you're listening to is something you don't know yes. so there's always added value there mm. well said so, it's huge it also requires you to put the ego in the back seat in order to be able to do that exactly. because naturally instinctively many you want to be heard yes and you want to be the smartest person in the room yes it takes a lot of discipline yes i mean uh, i guess the uh, meditation is a form of that yes it's a it's a form of self-discipline mm-hmm. of being able to uh, put yourself you know behind you know in in islam prayer really you know when I pray to God five times a day this is my time where I'm putting myself and life and all the clutter in life behind and I'm looking at uh, a conversation connecting and uh, I think every culture every religion finds its own way yes to push back oneself and to look at something bigger yes very true so it's um, On the flip side of it, unfortunately, we live just, you know, humans the way they are. And now with technology, everyone has an opinion. And we hear a lot of rubbish advice. What's (laughs) perhaps something that was absolutely rubbish that was put your way at some stage in your life that you immediately know, like you knew, this is rubbish, I'm not going to follow it. It's so rubbish, I don't remember. (laughs) I'm sure there's plenty of it. Yeah, 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 no, it's... uh... You know, with life, you just, you nod in courtesy and just... You let it just go over. Let it go over. Yeah. There's so many things that you will face and you you can, you're the only one that can judge what works for you and what doesn't. So. Yes. And it, it's, it's that, it's, it's realizing, and this comes, I guess, with a, with a bit of wisdom, that only because it works for person X... It might be great. It's not necessarily something that's going to work for me. Exactly. I mean, maybe someone says something to me, maybe because I know it off the back of my hand. It doesn't mean anything to me or it just comes out strange. It doesn't speak in the same way that I can understand it. And I would be like, you know, nodding. But that same sentence for another person would be an aha moment. You know, uh, it opened up their... So I guess... What works with some doesn't work with others. You just have to s- navigate what kind of information you get in. Yes. And don't, even your mind, don't over clutter it with information. Sometimes we can become hoarders, even yes. in information. Very true. Yeah. So to make sure that we're not hoarding information, yes. your kids have learned a lot from you, no doubt. But if you could only share with them one thought, a skill, or a way of being in order to give them the best chance of having their best lives. And with the whole principle of not hoarding, you can only share one. What would be that critical factor to success for them to have just their best lives and their versions? The best advice I can give them is to believe in themselves. Don't, mm. you know, don't question themselves so much. Do your homework, do your effort, but then 
take all that and put yourself out there because you'll never know what you're missing unless you really put yourself out there. Yeah, that's that's really good. Yeah, you can't believe how many um, young people I meet sometimes, and they, you know, in an interview, they um, they would say something, but then they would hammer themselves, yeah. and they would self sabotage their own, um, you know, achievements, or uh, you know, uh, she would say, yeah, I'm I'm for example, I'm really good in doing this and this and this, but actually this one I don't think I can do it. So. They, because maybe life has become so competitive now, um, you know, the amount of young people graduating university, it's becoming so cutting edge, there's so much happening and yes. there's no time to process. So they question themselves so much, so many times that they're not able to sit and reflect and really to grow into their full selves. Yes. And to that person who's watching or listening, if they go, hey, that's me. You know, I know I'm capable or I can be capable and I know self-belief is important, but I lack it. Would you, would you have a tip or two to help them raise their confidence? Because what you're saying is real and, and we're seeing a lot of it today. I think uh, don't be arrogant thinking you know everything. Learn as much as you want about a subject that you're interested in or something that you want to do. Put your pe best effort, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, there's no downside in it. Yes. You learn along the way why it didn't work and do it better the next time. There's no downside there. But put yourself out there. Oh, that's fantastic. I really want to uh, thank you for taking the time because I know you have a busy schedule and uh, you no, made a choice very to. It's interesting. I, thank you. Uh, you're very easy to talk to. Thank so, you. I appreciate uh, it. I bloody hope so. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, for you to be able to carve that time, I really appreciate it. Um, but I wanted to come visit Ras Al Khaimah because I'm going to. Really, I've, I've been a few it. times, I've said but it, I'm going to come. Yeah, you have to see it through our eyes. Sure, and, uh, 100%. And I invite everyone to come to Ras Al Khaimah. Yes, That's absolutely. Amazing. I was actually going to say um, we're going to place all the links uh, on the show notes. So whoever's watching and whoever's listening, they'll have all the links. But if someone would like to dive into your world, um, how, can they, how can they follow you and the great work you're doing? Well, you know, um, what I'm doing now uh, is really uh, a collective effort of the whole team of yes. the media office. So um, the things that we are doing or the things that we're highlighting that other entities are doing, yes. you can find them all on uh, Rack Media Office. So we have Instagram, mm -hmm. we have Twitter, we have LinkedIn. Super. We have, uh, and there's a lot of good stories in there. So I'm sure. you're able to look and relate to one of them or two of them. And maybe it's something that will entice you to do something with it. So. Yes. Yes. I mean, on my list is um, the zip line for sure. Yes. I'd like to do it because I was told about this last year. And we had a guest, uh, Tima Derian, who's, you know, the, the uh, young Arab who, who summited yes. Everest. Yes. And when I was asking her about her practice, she was saying she actually practices. Oh, at Jebel okay. Jace. All right. Yes. Um, so I definitely want to it's check it out. It's remarkable. It's so majestic just standing there. Yes. Now, you know, when I first joined, I said, okay, you know, that would be a good entrance. Get on the zip line, zip my yeah. way through. Uh, <laughs> to to Russell Russell Kema, Kema. Yeah. And say I'm here. <laughs> but then I went up, I looked down and I said, <laughs> I don't think so, but that will, prob that will <laughs> but probably I'm be I'm afraid me. of heights, but it's really now yeah. they open actually more um, uh, adventure, the adventure park that opened with more options for okay. those who can't stomach the full ride. There are other um, Shorter options ones. as well. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure about going up the mountain, but I'll probably do the zip lining part. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like to think it's, it's going to be fun. Uh, for whoever did it, they say it is unbelievable. Okay. It's such a rush, it's enthralling, it's, uh, it's everything. It's, um, I'm looking forward to it. I'll take you up on the offer. The mountains are quite majestic. When you yes. see them, it's just different shades and the, the clouds are just going through them. It's, uh, you, you do feel different. I mean, I've, yes. been, I've been to Ras Al Khaimah a few times, you sense the difference. Yes. And that's the beauty about where we live. All seven Emirates are different. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and they're all within Absolutely. driving distance. And I love what you said about when you, we travel to places like Japan or any other country, mm -hmm. like I was in the Netherlands recently, yeah. I had been to four or five cities. Exactly. Uh, our United Arab Emirates, 
I'm sure it will be like that, you know, where people get the chance, they want to go check out Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, Ras Al Khaimah. I mean, for any tourist that's coming from abroad, you are getting more return on your investment on your ticket by really putting yourself out there and looking at everything. But yes. also equally, our job is to say that we exist and these are the offerings that we have. Yes. So. And I'm sure many more, more great things me. to come. Yes. <laughs> Um, folks, uh, I, I had such an amazing time. I, I learned some great gems and I really recommend that you go over this video if you're watching a second time or if you're listening to this on the podcast, listen to it a second time. As you know, as always, I go through these uh, conversations a second time be because I write summary notes and we make it available on kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash podcast. And I'm going to do the same here. Um, the embodiment of our guest in terms of what she does, you know, Things that I've learned that come to my mind right now is the importance of preparation before going into anything. We often make assumptions with great individuals who are doing great things that it just comes easy for them or they just walk in and they wing it. And it's, it was evident that it's not the case with you. You know, Every single thing that I heard, you're preparing for it in advance, uh, which, which is remarkable. It's evident that you're hard. Oh, you mean it didn't come naturally to it? <laughs> just I apologize. It all came naturally. <laughs> no. That's true. Uh, and, you know, the importance of hard work and, you know, developing your communication skill, that being able to tell a story and cutting through the noise and so much more, um, which I'm going to get when I'm doing the summary notes. So I really appreciate um, you sharing that and thank being you. open about it. Um, and thank you for your time. And uh, I have to say, I mean, maybe something we didn't cover. But yes. I really have to say that. I'm very fortunate Yes. in the sense that um, the people that have supported me, uh, starting from my father to my friends, to my former boss, to my current um, uh, boss, they all really um, have a vision. They mm. have uh, an unbelievable um uh, character that uh, really uh, sets them as a mentor for myself. Yes. So I've had it the easy way because I've had great people and I have great people to look up to. So, yes, uh, truly remarkable. Yeah. yeah. So this really puts my life and sums it up. And um, yeah, hopefully I can give back, you know, yes. pay it forward one day. You, you know? forced me to ask you one more question before we close off. <laughs> because, and it is so important that you've had the good fortune of having great individuals as, as a father yes. figure and people around you and so forth. If someone says, I know the importance of a support system, I don't have one, what would be your recommendation for them to go and create one? Because none of us have been able to do what we do without standing on shoulders of giants and having a great support system? I think we all have, a hero can be in anyone. Yes. We all have people around us, but I think a lot of people are just shy to say, we need that help or we don't know or they don't ask. And I just think it's okay to put ourselves out there. Everyone is struggling, no matter how accomplished or not accomplished, everyone's struggling. I've learned to ask for help. Yes. I've learned to say, I don't know please tell me how to do it or I'm struggling with this. Would you do that? It's okay. Well said. That, that's fantastic. There you go. One, that was one last gym. <laughs> See, we just drop it at any time. Um, folks, as you know, the show has got nothing to do with showing off. We hope that with every guest, as I'm sure we have today, that we help you get inspired, get informed and get going. I'm if gonna you read it. Yeah. Well, Thank you. It won't match the Da Vinci <laughs> yes. code and, no. the, and the Googling. It's very, very different and very short. Um, and if you have any questions, um, if you resonated with any particular thought and you'd like to carry on the conversation, please ask your questions. I'll try and answer them. Uh, I'll try and ask Heba, but I know she's busy, but we'll try and answer them as much as we can. But we would love to hear from your contribution as well. Um, until the next episode, remember, be kind, be ambitious, be grateful. I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. This is How Do They Do It. You're a super cool person. You, you know? are. Um, you know, looking past the corporate, I can really see you're a super cool person. You keep so, it real. Yeah, absolutely. You know, don't I, mean, I love it. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like you're, you've reached something and yeah. you're, you know, you're tapping too much yourself. Yeah. It's good. You have to. By the yes. way, we don't tap ourselves on the enough. shoulder enough. Yes. Yeah. But also you keep it real. Yeah, you know? absolutely.